This is Mark Steiner, and welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News and to another episode of Rise of the Right. Recently, I traveled to Texas with my colleagues, Max Alvarez and Kayla Rivara, to see what life was like when the right wing begins to seize power. Now, we'll be bringing you a series of conversations and a special production on Texas in the coming weeks. But today, I want to share with you the conversation we had with Jim Hightower. He's a former agricultural commissioner in Texas who is the personification of left egalitarian populism and the progressive strain in our politics that's still strong throughout Texas, the West, parts of the South, and across the country. Jim has been a force in progressive politics in Texas, in our country, and the progressive wing of the Democratic Party for decades. He produces his radio commentary called High Tower Radio and writes a syndicated column called High Tower Lowdown and hosts and produces a really informative and entertaining video podcast called High Tower Chat and Chew. And we'll be linking to all those on our site. He's also the author of numerous books. Let me give you some of my favorite titles. One is, There's Nothing in the Middle of the Road but Yellow Stripes and Dead Armadillas. And Thieves in High Places, They've Stolen Our Country, and It's Time to Take It Back. And another, Swim Against the Current, Even a Dead Fish Can Go With the Flow. That's just the name of a few. The books are great, they're entertaining, and they dive deep into stuff. Jim Hightower invited us to his home and took us on this journey from history to the present day to what it takes to defeat the monstrous power of the right and to build a society for all the people. So please, enjoy my conversation with American populist Jim Hightower. Uh, Jim, I, I want to, first of all, let me say thank you for letting us come to your house. Well, of course. Delighted to have you. It's a lovely place. Really a lovely place. Old time place. Yeah. Uh, old Austin. <laughs> old time uh, place for a couple of old timers. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, there's so much to talk about here. I mean, you have been involved in fighting for a progressive populist Texas, a Texas that brings economic liberty and fights racism and does all the rest in this state your whole life, right? And I, I just, just, just in, the, in a in kind of pragmatic philosophical sense, I just like to start at kind of your thinking about this arc of the battle of Texas that in some ways is emblematic of the battle for the entire country between populism, progressive ideas, and building an equitable society, and it's very opposite. The chief political issue in Texas uh, from the very start uh, 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 of the Anglo settlement here uh, in the 1820s, say, uh, and forward, uh, through today, and I think also the chief political struggle in America. Uh, it comes down to this. Too few people control too much of the money and power, and they use that money and power to get more for themselves at our expense. That's the fight we're in, and that's the fight that America has been in from the founding, uh, and that Texas has certainly been in uh, from the start. The, I know that Texas is perceived as a far right-wing state now, uh, but the, the original state constitution in Texas outlawed banks. You were not allowed to create a bank here <laughs> because the farmers who settled this state, ang- of the Anglo farmers who came in to settle the state, uh, came out of the southern tenant farm system where banks ripped them off and the railroad corporations ripped them off. And the same thing was happening here in Texas, in the, uh, particularly after the Civil War uh, that led to the rise of the populist movement. Uh, began in Lampasas, Texas, about uh, 90 miles in that direction, uh, with uh, four farmers uh, sitting around a kitchen table in a farmhouse saying, we got to do something. We're going broke. Uh, And what had happened is that they had come into Texas uh, fleeing the tenant farm system uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and looking for new opportunity but the, the rich farmland was in East Texas, and it was kind of already taken. So they kind of kept moving west, and they didn't realize that they were moving to beyond the 33-inch rainfall standard that you had to have to make a crop. <laughs> and so, so they were out there with dry land farms uh, and drought hitting them. At the same time, the, the banks uh, were charging outrageous interest rates uh, on them and the railroad corporations, which control their shipment of their crops to Dallas and Austin and Houston and, and the markets, uh, were ripping them off at, at the same time. Uh, so that led to a, a rebellion of 
ordinary working stiffs that was not just farmers. They also organized black uh, uh, members of uh, farmers, but also uh, factory workers uh, in, in East Texas and down in the Houston area and et cetera. So it was a real people's movement. Uh, that, that, that really launched this state. And that spirit of populism is still alive and well uh, in our state. Uh, it's presently uh, uh, sublimated <laughs> by corporate power uh, and et cetera, but uh, the spirit is still there in the heart of the people, and that's what we have to appeal to. So I, I'm, it, it, a whole lot of things get fast in my mind as you were speaking. And uh, first thing though is it's a little aside. When did your family get here? Um, my family came in, they were tenant farmers uh, coming across uh, from Tennessee and uh, Alabama and uh, North Carolina and coming into Texas uh, about four generations ago. Uh, my mother and father were both raised on farms uh, and uh, hard scrabble farms during the depression. Uh, so they were de depression kids. Uh, and they, and my father's mother, uh, told him uh, when he was 18, uh, get off the farm. <laughs> there's, there's nothing here for you. And so he went to Dallas, which was 30 miles away from where he, his farm was, uh, and, and hooked up into a, a business enterprise that let him go then to Denison, Texas, uh, right on the Red River. Uh, the Red River being the north boundary of, of Texas, we were we're the first line of defense against the Okies, <laughs> so, the Red River. <laughs> Luckily, I was born on the t two miles on the south side of, of that river. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he and my mother were able to establish uh, a uh, middle, lower middle class possibility for my two brothers and myself and themselves. Uh, uh, they were new dealers. Uh, they believed in Franklin Roosevelt and. Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and, and, and they realized uh, that they did not create their wealth. <laughs> they realized that they were beneficiaries of, of a long history, of an educational system, of a, of a community. Uh, and uh, as my, my, my father did not know he had a political philosophy, <laughs> uh, but he did. Uh, and he expressed it to me periodically in these terms. He said, everybody does better when everybody does better. And, and, and that is as radical a political notion as I've ever heard of. And that is, that is a, a core political belief among the people of, of our, our state, even today. Uh, and so we've got to get back to that spirit and to cultivate, uh, nurture that spirit uh, across the board. So what do you think happened between whether it's the era of the Texas People's Party that took place, the whole populist movement, you, Molly Ir Ivins, and, and that whole movement that was, that was part of a pushing Texas into a very populist way, in a progressive way. And now we have this wave of... of uh, of this kind of radical right that has taken over the state, uh, even though every election is tight, they have taken over the state. So what, and, and you've been in it for, for, for decades. So what's your analysis of what actually happened and why? Money. <laughs> Money happened. Uh, uh, what, what happened was that uh, the corporate power began to amass banking power uh, and, uh, and, and manufacturing corporate power, and of course oil and gas, uh, and et cetera, uh, and has long been uh, more than influential in the Texas legislature uh, with the money that they spent there, the lobbying money, uh, and, the, and, and the, the, the soft bribery. You know, you, you'd be a legislator in the, uh, in the 1950s, and, uh, and there would be poker games every night, and if you were a good boy during the day, you won the poker pot that night. <laughs> so there was kind of a system that, 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 that affected some people and, and, and enough to affect legislation. But what fundamentally has happened is that in the 1980s, uh, my party, the Democratic Party, uh, quit being little d Democrats. Uh, they decided 
uh, the powers that be within the party decided that they could get some of that corporate money too. Uh, and uh, not just let the Republicans have it all, we, we could get money from those corporations uh, because those corporations have no ideology <laughs> except money. <laughs> and so, so they, they shifted their policy uh, from grassroots politics to money politics uh, and began to, to, to solicit those corporate checks. And I can tell you from my own political life and in, 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 in office here in Texas, I've seen it happen that if that when you get one of those corporate checks uh, written on the back is the corporate agenda. <laughs> And they're cashing the check, not you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you are the cash <laughs> that they are buying. Uh, and, and that led to a, a, an abdication by our, our democratic leadership, uh, national as well as state, uh, of uh, grassroots politics and workaday people and dirt farmers, uh, environmentalists, regular working stiffs. Uh, to turn to the money interests. Uh, and so the Democratic Party began to support uh, corporate policies. Uh, and then the, the regular people out in the countryside were saying, what, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you know, they no longer saw uh, a, a political campaign of the old time Democratic style that Ralph Yarbrough had and that Molly Ivins, as you uh, mentioned, uh, supported uh, editorially. Uh, and that, that I campaigned for and others. They, that, that began to disappear because Democrats decided we can take the money, put it on TV, and we'll win the elections. Well, uh, that didn't work out because we don't have enough money to compete on TV with the Republicans and with the corporate uh, power interests. And so uh, what resulted was not that Texas turned right wing, it quit voting. We have, we have had the lowest voter turnout in Texas consistently in the last 20, 30 years of any state uh, in the country. Uh, and it's not going to get better until we put together that grassroots politics again that appeals on the issues of economic fairness, social justice, equal opportunity that the Democratic Party was built on. And if we get back to that, then uh, we, we will begin to, to regain power from, because the, the Republican powers and the, and the corporate powers are a minority uh, in the state. Uh, so, so we don't have to, they fear the majority. Uh, we are the majority, but we have to rally it. So I want to circle back to this, what you just said. I think it's really important to kind of, to lay into this and get into this. Texas is now facing this House Bill 2127, the Death Star Bill. Workers are being denied on days like this and hotter days than this, water breaks. I mean, which is absolute insanity. I mean, I, you can't, I mean, you can't imagine it. I mean, how you could even do that. I mean, I, I was, when I was a young guy, I, I worked construction. I, I worked in the fields. I, you know, I worked for a farmer. I, not take a water break? Yeah. Right. How do you survive? <laughs> yeah, That's right. crazy. Yeah. So it's gotten to that point, though. And even though the last election was just, I mean, what was it? It, it was maybe... Two million votes, two hundred thousand votes between uh, Beto and and the clown who's in office now, but they were able to do it. So talk a, a, a I mean, because they have clearly seized power, and they've created this bill. What that bill really means, and what how you organize against it, and for something different. So so the bill known as the Death Star Bill, uh, it, it is not just about uh, the fact that uh, the state has usurped. Uh, the power of every city and county in our state uh, to be self-governing, <laughs> uh, to to set their own regulations about uh, environmental impacts, about uh, corporate money and politics, uh, uh, about loan sharking, you know, et cetera. Uh, but it's fundamentally uh, a bill that usurps democracy. It takes away your right to be a self-governing people. Uh, we are a constitutionally a home rule state, meaning that cities have the right and the, and the preference to be the first source of legislation, the primary source of legislation, because this government is closer to the people uh, than go to try to find your state senator or something or other. 
Uh, so, so that's that's why this bill uh, is it, it is loved by the corporate powers and by the lobbyists uh, because it concentrates power in just a few people. If you, if you only have to talk to the governor, then you're doing fine. But if you got to talk to uh, city councils and county commissioners all around the state, then you've got a problem. <laughs> uh, you, you've got to make sense to them. And this legislation makes no sense whatsoever. The people are overwhelmingly against it. And I don't mean just the, the progressives are against it. The, the conservative mayors and city council people are, are wildly against this and fighting it, fi filing suit against it. You have this great quote that um, you said that the, the delusional is, is, is no longer marginal. It's come in from the fringe to sit in the seat of power. And that's where we find ourselves. And my thought when I read that quote, thinking about coming here today, was that you spent your life fighting for the kind of world that is economically, racially, politically, environmentally just. Even as agricultural commissioner, I mean, you, you fought hard as agricultural commissioner to make that a reality in Texas. And now, well, here you sit on your porch, you're 80, I'm 77, and you watch this go on around you. So, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that and the struggle that has been fought from the Populist Party on to this moment to see that happen and how we work together to, to, to influence other people to fight back and make that change? Well, the struggle is what matters. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we've been through this in Texas, uh, the populist movement, uh, as we indicated, uh, 1870s, basically uh, was crushed by the banks and the, and the uh, railroad corporations and others uh, by 1900. Uh, but then came the progressive movement out of that, uh, fighting Bob La Follette out of Wisconsin, uh, a, a ter terrific movement. The labor movement then rose up. Uh, civil rights movement came forward. The women's movement came forward. Environmental movement came forward. So we've always had the struggle, uh, and bringing that to fore, uh, you know, we, we've we've had uh, times when when I I ran in uh, 80, uh, 1980 to to be the agriculture uh, commissioner. You won. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I won. Ann Richards ran as treasurer. She won. won. Jimmy Maddox, attorney general. He won. Gary Morrow, land commissioner. He won. We were all young people with our own con kind of in individual constituencies to add to the mix. And then we ran together. We campaigned saying, it's not just elect me, elect a government. And, and we'll put this government on your side. And we did that. Uh, and then again, the money came in in the, in the late 1980s. Uh, and, and, the, and the corporate money began to dominate all of our politics, so grassroots organizing went aside. Now, the good news is that organizing continues. Uh, the, the most encouraging thing to me uh, in, in America and in my travels around the country and, and here in Texas uh, are the grassroots progressive movements, uh, the environmental justice movement, for example. A woman named uh, Diane Wilson down on the Gulf Coast, uh, a shrimper, fourth, fourth generation Fisher play woman, um, fought uh, the, uh, the this huge plastics conglomerate out of Taiwan uh, f uh, for uh, 40 years. 40 years. She battled and battled and battled, losing, and 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 he, even even progressives gave up on her. Some of them, environmental groups, even said, "Well, she maybe she's too loopy. You know, she just keeps <laughs> fighting. You know, and and then." And then suddenly she won. Two years ago, she won a, a court case that she had filed uh, that uh, that brought uh, this uh, this uh, Formosa Plastics Corporation to their knees, and they they had to give in uh, to the demands of the Fisher uh, community uh, down there, and they began to make change, and 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 the judge put the uh, the compliance. Uh, focus not not on some government, but on the local grassroots people, and so they were in a position to to enforce it and make it happen. That's a tremendous victory. Uh, family farmers are doing the same thing right now, reviving, revitalizing, uh, and and and, uh, and 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 we're electing people. Uh, Greg Kassar got elected here in the Austin San Antonio uh, district. Uh, young. Uh, a Latino worker advocate, uh, major, major change, who's become a force already in his first term in Congress, or become a force within the Democratic caucus saying, stop talking bullshit, start doing something, you know, and, and that, that is change. 
That, that is what produces the change. When the people get riled up and then begin to organize and, and create their own networks of power, and, and that, is, that is what is happening. So I was, as, as you're speaking, I, I thought of two things. One was, um, yes, you have so many great quotes I could be here all day and just throw them out and we can talk about them. But you, you said, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure what you're referring to, but you said, makes me happier um, than a mosquito in a nudist colony. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, that, that is, and that is those those groups that are out there. I use that line part of me in, in, uh, at the opening of any talk that, that I give, that just to be in the presence of people who are making this kind of difference. And, and these are not the, the political, uh, within the Democratic Party, political powers or within the pres progressive community, the political powers. They're ordinary working day people. Uh, and they have the most common sense and, and, and the most ability. And they, and they recognize what's happening in the state legislature just a few blocks down the street here. Uh, you know, B Benjamin Franklin uh, said that, that the destiny of America is not power. It's light, and he meant the light of our democratic ideals, economic fairness, social justice, equal opportunity for all people. And yet, you know, we've got too many five-watt bulbs sitting in 100-watt sockets down here in the legislature and in Congress, uh, and not even caring about the light. Uh, but the people care about that light. They still have those values within them. And so you, to, to build a, a progressive politics, you have to tap those values uh, again and again and again, saying this is what we stand for. And, and it's not this particular bill or that particular bill. It's, it's, that, it's that sense of everybody does better when everybody does better. So clearly, I mean, everything you've been writing and our conversation here today on your porch, you have maintained a commitment to the struggle to make it better, but you've also maintained an optimism. You, you, I mean, you do not sound like a man who sees defeat at the door because they've pushed this bill through 2027 because they have so much power in Texas. You don't seem like a man who is saying, no, we're done, we're defeated, yeah. they got us. <laughs> no, no, uh, they, they don't have us. Uh, again, there's so much ebb and flow to, to politics. When I, when I lost my race as ag commissioner for the, for the third term. Uh, you know, in my concession speech, I said, in Texas politics, uh, uh, one day you're a peacock, and the next day you're a feather duster. <laughs> you know, so so it, it, it ebbs and flows, you know. Uh, but you, you keep building. Uh, and, and you keep, if you're, if you're getting your information just from the media, establishment media, or, or, you're, or you're just paying attention to Washington and, and the legislature here in Austin, you're going to be depressed. But if you go out in the countryside and see what people are doing and have conversations with people at a bar or, or at a coffee shop, uh, uh, at, at the feedlot, you know, uh, they, you find you have so much more in common uh, than, than you do difference. And the politics that the right wing is playing is to find the difference and to just grind that in, into, in, in, into nothing. Uh, and and they, ha they have nowhere to go with that because that's depressing. The American people are not a depressed people. Uh, we, we, we get depressed every now and then. But again, we have always resurged uh, the, uh, in, in the, in the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, there was a progressive movement here in Texas. Uh, Texas had become a corporate state. Uh, and uh, and but and and the progressives were were almost like in a phone booth together, you know. Oh, we're 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 we we can't do anything, you know. Uh, but uh, but then people began to realize, wait a minute, maybe we could do something. Uh, for example, they had uh, in in the 1950s uh, the establishment media, which at that time were the major newspapers, uh, Dallas Morning News, Houston Houston Chronicle, etc. Uh, they they paid no attention to progressive going on, so, so people didn't hear. Wait a minute, there's a success over here. Ralph Yarbrough, the great fighting 
uh, liberal uh, Democrat here in Texas, U.S. Senator. He could have a rally in Dallas, 5,000 people would turn out. Next day, nothing in the Dallas Morning News, not a mention of it. And so they came up with a slogan, the progressives did, said, for the Dallas News, said, yeah. we're the Dallas Morning News. If it happens in Dallas, it's news to us. You know? <laughs> and so, so you, you've got to use humor, you know, and rally people around. And so they created the Texas Observer to be a medium for progressive ideas. And then they organized over, particularly in East Texas, in the African-American communities over there, because you had to pay to vote back in those days, poll tax cost about $25 in today's money. Now, it's hard enough to get people to vote anyway, but you're gonna charge them $25? So unions organized, uh, progressive groups organized, and went out and organized to pay the poll tax of people over there so that they could vote and understood what it meant to, to vote. So that kind of organizing, that's the infrastructure that I'm talking about that, that reaches out uh, to people. And so that created a movement that elected Ralph Yarborough, elected Barbara Jordan to Congress, Bob Eckhart to Congress, uh, uh, Henry B. Gonzalez out of San Antonio, the first Mexican American to go uh, to Congress uh, from Texas. Uh, you know, uh, again, it created a movement. Uh, and again, here come the money powers. They always come back uh, and they change things. They, they, they began to take power back. Uh, and uh, and they, they took on John Connolly, the, the governor of, of our state, and uh, and, uh, and and Connolly uh, got fed up with being uh, uh, accused of being non-progressive, so he switched parties to Republican. Uh, and Ralph Yarborough, the U.S. senator who hated Connolly, and Connolly hated him, Ralph Yarborough said, when Connolly switched parties, said it's the first time in history that a rat has swum toward a sinking ship. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so that enlivens people and, and gives them gives them hope. And uh, and then then we came along, Ann Richards, me and Maddox and Morrow and et cetera, and we created a, a new progressive movement that was really dynamic. And, that, and now that's that's faded away with the big money coming back. But it's it's coming back the other way too, because we're organizing and we're building that infrastructure. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I mean, one of the things that struck me in my time here over this last bunch of days in Austin and, and San Antonio, and interviewing people um, uh, from unions and other places across, um, is that people are on the move to push back. So how do you see that? I mean, you you are in it. You observe it. Um, you're not done. I mean, we came to your house today. You were in the middle of a meeting, so you're not finished at all about no, what you're no, doing, no. right? Yeah, right. So so, how do you see the resistance from places like Austin and San Antonio and Houston and East Texas? How do you see that coming together to be the opposition to stop? the right from actually taking over everything in this state, which is also going to push the country right. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, it, it, it has to come together with a cohesive uh, politics. We have the elements out there, but they're not together. And we don't have the party structure that pulls it together yet. We have the progressive instinct. We have the demographics of... Uh, of uh, uh, pe people of color in particular, and I don't mean just Mexican American and African American, uh, but uh, you know, Houston School District teaches 165 languages in their schools. So, uh, this this is a whole new world. Texas, you know, they they can do all the anti woke stuff that, that they want, but the truth is, uh, this is a woke state. <laughs> uh, and when those people began to come together. Uh, and, and it takes the, the organizational structure, uh, and we're making progress on that. We're not there. Uh, again, we have too many counties with uh, with no Democratic Party structure. Uh, how we did have, that happen? How, how could not, not not that everybody who's a Democrat is progressive or on the left or pushing? I mean, there's a lot of moderates and conservatives as well. But how does it happen in a state like this that all those counties are like almost like? I give up, we can't do it anymore, we're done. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's because there's no support system. Uh, if, 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 you're, if you're candidates, if a candidate for president, presidential candidates come through here all the time, Democratic Party uh, presidential candidates, uh, but they don't, they don't go to East Austin. 
they they don't go to uh, Caldwell County or they, they don't go out to Brownsville, Lubbock, Amarillo, Ty, Tyler, Texarkana. They, they come to the money centers and they get money and they leave and they don't. And our our party chair used to say, "Leave ten percent, <laughs> tip us, <laughs> leave ten percent, and we can do something with that money. We can help organize." Uh, so you're out there in a rural area, a red red area that has been taken over uh, by these uh, party interests, uh, by these right wing interests, uh, and you, you get the feeling alone. Uh, in 2016, when Hillary Clinton ran for president, uh, to get a Hillary yard sign, you had to pay five dollars. What? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to get people to put a yard sign up, and you're charging them five dollars. Like that's going to make a difference in your campaign. And, and a yard sign in a red area sends a signal to other progressives in that area, you're not alone, I'm here. <laughs> and they put a sign up, and another sign goes up, and you begin to connect. And then you say, wait a minute, we don't even have a Democratic committee here. Why don't we organize a Democratic committee? All you have to do is have 10 people come together, and you are the Democratic Party in that county. Uh, so it's, it's as simple and as difficult <laughs> as, as that. So it's... In, it, when, you, when you look at the roots of things like the Texas Populist Party, when you look at the roots of the progressive movement, the roots of the, of the union movement in the state, the struggles of, of, of black and Mexican people in the state, one of the things that all that centered around was a word you keep talking about and alluding to, which is organizing. And I mean, that is... Yeah, the, and, and by organizing... And this is really important. Uh, too much of our politics has become meetings. Let's form a committee. Let's have a meeting. Let's discuss. Let's have a task force. Uh, no, no, no. The populist movement built in Texas, 1870s, rural areas uh, where people were, were illiterate. They weren't stupid, but they were not educated. Uh, and they were disparate. Uh, they, you, you were miles from your neighbor. Uh, you know, uh, to, to bring them together, they formed a cultural movement. So they had parties, they had bands, uh, they put on plays, uh, they, they just, they had fun, and that brought people together. Uh, and and uh, as, as a group up in Wisconsin I've been associated with, Fighting Bob La Follette Festival up there, uh, Ed Garvey, who started that, uh, used to say, you know, let's put the party back in politics. And that's exactly what we need to do. A friend of mine in, in, in Washington, uh, uh, keeps, he's, he lives in Maryland, actually, and he keeps getting invited to, to Democratic Party functions. And he finally said to him, you know, if you'd pour a little red wine every now and then, I might come to one of your meetings. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, it ought to be fun to be in politics uh, and, and not just tedious uh, drudgery. <laughs> uh, and, and so getting back to that uh, and... And, and there, there are movements to do that. For example, here in Texas, there's a great movement of, uh, of uh, young uh, Latina uh, teenagers, really. Uh, and they, they have uh, quinceaneras uh, where you become of age as a, as, as a Latina girl, I think it's 15, uh, and you have this party. Uh, and people come and bring gifts, and it's a celebration. Uh, but this group started organizing that instead of bringing gifts, give money to organize, and you have to register to vote to come into the room. <laughs> you know, I mean, understanding the culture and then using that culture uh, as as a medium to connect to people, and that's why musicians are are important. I I, I never had a political event without. Uh, you know, I mean, a couple with Willie Nelson even, but but Steve Fromholz, uh, uh, Joe Ely, and uh, 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 Butch Hancock, and uh, uh, Marsha Ball, and these great musicians who are around here. People will come for music, you know, and they want to have a beer when they're doing it. Well, that's good politics, you know, uh, and and put put that together. I I think of Butch Hancock. He he's a great singer. He and Jimmy Dale Gilmore and uh, and Joe Ely formed a group called the, the Flatlanders. They're all out of Lubbock. And, uh, and uh, Butch Hancock was on a radio show I, I did for a while, and, and, uh, and he explained how tough it was to grow up out there in that Pentecostal right-wing world. And he said, they're always teaching, they're saying to us, uh, stay away from sex. Sex is the filthiest. Uh, it, it is the most ungodly. It, 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 it is just nasty. And then he said, they said, 
save it for someone you love. <laughs> so, though, you know, you, you got to use the culture and you got to use the humor and you got to tell stories. Uh, that's a political movement. Jim, this has really been a pleasure. It's, it's wonderful to see you again. It's, it's really been a pleasure to be invited to your home to have this conversation on your porch. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank Dave Hebden for running the show and editing the work to make me sound good. Tyler's Kayla Rivara making it all work behind the scenes. And Max Alvarez for wanting to make this journey to Texas and tell this story. And Laura Ehrlich, who heads up Hightower's sprawling research operation and made all this possible as well. Please let me know what you thought about what you've heard today and what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll write you right back. And stay tuned for more on the rise of the right and more about Texas. So for the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.